Ideas. Ideas are a clear point, message, theme, or storyline backed by important, carefully chosen details and supportive information. Organization. Organization is how a piece of writing is structured and ordered. Voice. The voice is the fingerprints of the writer on the page. The writer's own special personal style coming through the words, combined with concern for the informational needs and interests of the audience. Word choice. Word choice is the language, phrasing, and the knack for choosing the just right word to get the message across. Sentence fluency. Sentence fluency is the rhythm and sound of the writing as it is read aloud. Conventions. Conventions are the editorial correctness and attention to any detail a copy editor would review, including spelling, grammar and usage, capitalization, paragraph indentation, and punctuation. Tell me how you earned your stars today. Complete sentence. You have a star for a complete sentence. Period. A period at the end of your sentence. Capital letter. A capital letter. What do you have between your words? Spaces. You have spaces between your words. So you can have a far, four star sentence here. Can you read your sentence for me? What number is that that you wrote? 100. And one dollar nations are hard to keep track of. Okay, nice sentence. Thank you. Paige, I noticed that um, you have a rough draft of your of a story that you wrote. And uh, what did you choose for the title of your story? The slide and slide in winter sounds really interesting and I see here that you've published this story and when we conferenced about it you did a great job all five stars were there so we thought it was a good story to publish and I see that you did a picture plan to kind of plan for your writing and would you like to read that story sure. okay great we'd love to hear it the slide and winter dedicated to my family when it is snowing outside at school, I slide down the three-part slide. I let people do it too. Oh my gosh, I mean, almost everyone, oh my gosh, it is so fun. Some people tell you snow you, so you can go down the, uh, the slide is fast with the snow on it. I love it. Lots of people try it they, when they see you, when they see other people. Just the, it's spectacular when you put the snow under your bottom and slide down. Everyone, everyone, just everyone does it. I like the sign. Nice job, Paige. Hi, my name is Olivia Darius. Hi, my name is Gwen Belsa. Hello, my name is Thomas Johnston. You are a student to Mrs. Hamilton's second grade class at Murphy Elementary, and we are here to talk to you about the 6 plus 1 writing trait called word choice. When you write, you need to dig down deep to find just the right words for your story. You need to stretch your thinking and create a mental image. We are going to read your snowflake some words. We really try to use zest, style, and flavor to our stories. Snowflakes are as cold as a frost ice age, simmering as ice fresh from the freezer, delicate as my family photograph, Shiny as my mom's wedding ring. Yummy as an ice cream sundae with hot fudge. Soft as an open peacock's feathers. Beautiful as a diamond sparkling in the night. Snowflakes are soft as a very cozy and fluffy pillow. 
cold as ice cubes fresh from the freezer, light as fluffy clouds floating silently, sparkly as paper snowflakes with glittering glitter, light as blank white paper, shimmery as stars shining bright in the dark, yummy as cold icicles hanging from my roof. Snowflakes are fragile as a sparkling lace ribbon, delicate as a shimmering chandelier, cold as freshly scooped ice cream, icy as icicles that shimmer in the moonlight, soft as a, a feather pillow, lacy as a sleeve of a dress, wet as melted ice cubes. Thank you for listening and don't forget to add death, style, and flavor to everything you like. Hi, my name is Mariah Beebe. I attend Raleigh Elementary School, and Mr. Dutcher is my teacher. The Dead Jellyfish. It was a normal 94 degree sunny day in Gulf Shores, Alabama. My friend and I, Sierra Bain, were vacationing there. This particular day, we were at the beach. We were playing games such as hide and seek, tag, and ball. Then we noticed a pink jellyfish on the shore. People were throwing them at each other. We thought they were awesome, so we started approaching the spot. When we arrived, they were spl splattered everywhere, so it was hard to walk without stepping on them. Then it happened. She stepped on it. She squealed and flew in the air. She had a gloomy look on her face. Then she showed me her foot. It was covered with goo. After that, we started playing with them. Our parents weren't ple were not pleased. I'm Ryan Tyre. I go to Rye Elementary in Mr. Dutcher's class. The Hockey Championship Game. It's the championship game for the prowess hockey team. The fans are screaming, and the popcorn is popping, and the cameras are clicking. The announcers are announcing. It's second period, and the score is tied 0-0. Zero zero. Then Tyler, coming off the bench, got the puck and passed it to me. I shot the puck, and there was Nick put, put it in the net. I felt so happy and freaked because the other team can go back and score to tie the game. But nope, we played hard and good. We kept them from scoring. The puck is in their zone with five seconds left in the game. It was what I was watching the puck. I was watching the clock five. Four, three, two, one. The buzzer went off and my team won the championship game. That is the first history championship game. Hi, my name is Megan Gifford and I go to Hazlitt Middle School. Um, and I'm in Mr. Keith Nair's language arts class. In Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge learns a very important lesson. After being visited by three ghosts, Scrooge realizes that he was never going to benefit from being self-centered all the time. He instead finds out that the best way to receive joy is to give joy. Before Scrooge was visited by the three spirits, he was greedy and never gave, only took. After his change of heart, he did great deeds of good, such as purchasing a prized turkey for the Cratchit family. Scrooge also gave a hearty sum of money to the poor. As you can see, in A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge undergoes a great transformation that will lead to his happiness in the future. My name is Lee Snyder. I'm a freshman. And my prompt for this essay was to discuss two themes in the book we just read. In a world filled with empty, staring eyes, starving children, and a place that should seemingly be devoid of beauty, Francie Nolan, the main character of Betty Smith's poignant novel, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, manages to find evidence of beauty everywhere. While she is not naive enough to believe that Williamsburg, the small section of Brooklyn she grows up in, is a beautiful safe haven for its residents, she does notice the unappreciated grandeur of its narrow, dirty streets and its inhabitants. Francie and her parents' ability to see and value unrecognized beauty and their understanding that beauty unnoticed often lives and thrives more so than beauty which is seen by all becomes a subtle yet central theme of the book. A more obvious theme of the book is education leads to success, both in one's moral views and in the business world. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, Keats 1. A better and more accurate definition of what beauty is cannot be found. 
Keats' statement fully encompasses the soul of beauty. The characters Betty Smith creates in A Tree Girls in Brooklyn wholly understand the spirit of the statement. Katie, Francie, and John, Johnny repeatedly prove the book's principal theme, unrecognized beauty, often flourishes more than that which much, much of society sees and accepts. The ability, to, the ability to see past the grime and notice the small worlds and unique attributes that each person and thing possess is a rare gift. However, all of these characters see the splendor of the world. Each character expresses the hidden beauties he or she discover in ways unique to each personality. While Johnny may have a drinking problem and cannot hold a steady job, the exquisiteness of life often causes him to burst out in song. Then, as whenever he is moved or stirred, he has to put it into a song. Smith 170 to 171. Katie's responses to the hardships of life is to harden herself, to rid her personality of the old tenderness that had made her such a fine young woman, to barricade her heart and soul to the tender intricacies and beauty of life. At times... My name is Laura Dewitt. My name is Erica Betts. And my name is David Gale. In AP English, following each piece of literature under study, we write an in-class essay on a never-before-seen prompt written in a 40-minute time period. When we choose to write it as a group of three, we create the introduction together, each write a body paragraph independently, then reconvene to construct the conclusion. We wrote our essay on the following prompt. Many plays and novels use contrasting places to represent opposed forces or ideas that are central to the meaning of the work. Write an essay explaining how the places in The Great Gatsby differ, what each place represents, and how their contrasts contribute to the meaning of the work. And our essay is, vivid imagery and intri intricate details are commonplace in F. Scott Fitzgerald's masterpiece, The Great Gatsby. Ideas, emotions, and symbols are woven through the different scenes of the story, creating a, ver a veritable work of art. Rich and marvelous houses are matched against the background of a dark and dingy valley of ashes. Placed on adjacent, on adjacent pages, the old money east egg and the jazz age, the jazz age west egg seem so similar, but each represents an opposite view than that of their neighbor. Each setting that are, even settings that are mountain ranges apart, the east coast and the Midwest, are used to show opposing forces at play, representing ideas ranging from the American dream to its utter fa failure, and the big city success to troubled outskirts. The Great Gatsby portrays settings in stark contrast to one another, corresponding to their most fundamental meanings. Perhaps two of the most obvious contrasting settings of the work are the affluent West Egg and East Egg neighborhoods. When juxtaposed, their differences become alarmingly clear. The ambitious atmosphere of West Egg is home to those who have newly acquired money, while the lackadaisical atmosphere of East Egg casually comforts those who have inherited generations of wealth and refinement and are, in other words, known to be old money. The representations of West and East Egg are imperative in that they drive the actions and mentality of their inhabitants. West Egg is especially symbolic as being concentrated with ambition and materialistic aspirations of the American dream during the Jazz Age. However, East Egg is manifested with the extreme carelessness that comes with the extreme comforts of being in possession of extremely well-established wealth. West Egg resident Jay Gatsby is representative of the uncertainty in finally obtaining the green light goal, while the East Egg, as seen through Daisy and Tom Buchanan, radiates comfort and security, comfort in knowing that all fiscal means will always be secure. The contrasting differences and representations of the eggs are prodigal contributors to the meaning of this work in that they develop the mindset of the characters, as with the drive that keeps Daisy from leaving the solid foundation of old money for the instability of Gatsby's recent fortune. Just as these two communities can never be the same in a societal perspective, Gatsby and Daisy will never be able to unite. On the path from the plush eggs to the big city lies the Valley of Ashes. Its name alone gives rise to connotations of oblivion, waste, and death. This, in comparison with the sparkling and breathtaking metropolis at outskirts, illustrates the acute differences between New York City and its unpleasant byproduct. Fitzgerald explains through his ever-trustworthy narrator, Nick, that the Valley of Ashes is an industrial sort of place on the edge of a city, and is not just common to New York. Every large municipality has this wasteland of humanity. Given this universal statement, this area on the perimeter is thus symbolic of all the unpleasant effects of a beautiful endeavor, in this case, Manhattan. 
Not only does this region appear, appear as barren as the label seems, but the people who inhabit it are struggling gasoline attendants, failed optometrists, and desperate housewives, as compared with the carefree mint julep sipping socialites in the city. Even God is apparently devoid in the valley, as he is reduced to an advertisement in the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. This clear distinction between these two locales is critical to the meaning of the story. It is the radiant and affluent city which leads Jay Gatsby and Nick Carraway from their Midwest homes to the east. But when Nick's eyes are open to the Dr. Jekyll into which the Mr. Hyde of New York City eventually evolves, the Valley of Ashes, he is disillusioned and left with two options, return home or risk being swallowed up by the careless people who let others clean up the messes they make. One's original home can, can often be detected by certain rules. Whether a stout young man has a, has a southern drawl or a stern old lady speaks with a Michigan A vowel, certain ways of speaking correspond to a given area. But speech is not the only identifier that can separate regions. Lifestyle and personality may keep someone from being happy when placed in a new environment. All of the main characters from Gatsby hail from the Midwest, but are attempting to survive in a cutthroat East Coast world. Louisville, Kentucky is no New York, New York. That problem faces Dayton in her struggle to be happy. The only way she knows how to seem satisfied is to ignore morals and reject responsibility. Back in Kentucky, she had everything. A social life with the boys from the Army, love from Gatsby, a family, and ultimately, a wedding. But in these days, she is just a wife to an unfaithful husband. She has become cynical and unhappy on the coast, even hoping that her daughter will be a beautiful fool so she will not be smart enough to know of all the pain in the world. The difference between Daisy on the coast and the Daisy back in the Midwest is significant and illustrates the contrast of the two regions. The Midwest is a wholesome, untarnished life that each of the characters, in varying degrees, desires, but ironically leaves in hopes for, in hopes for, the, for the East Coast. Tragically, the coast does nothing to quench any thirst for morality and simplicity. It only serves as another physical manifestation of the dis distortion and luxury of the area, of the era. As a result, Daisy becomes a cynic, Tom a cruel, hardy Letus, and Gatsby a corpse. The Great Gatsby takes place in a wide spectrum of settings. It spans the brash ambition of wealth in the West Egg to the refined old money of the East Egg. The decaying Valley of Ashes and the glittering metropolitan area are also symbolically juxtaposed to examine the differences between this facade of a beautiful city life and its grimy industrial alter ego. Even the Midwest and its relative, relatively moral virginity is compared to the East Coast's moral debauchery. Fitzgerald's multifaceted landscape for the novel lends itself to the tale's greater meaning. In the end, it is what the various settings symbolize that ends Daisy and Gatsby's hope for love, prompts Nick's to return home, and ultimately destroys Jay Gatsby. <laughs>